All right, so at this point, we've covered um, almost everything except for things that are related to ethics that was on the, the syllabus that was posted on campus. So remember on the syllabus, it said like the, the schedule would sort of grow organically, but these are the topics that we were going to hit, and I would probably hit all of those and maybe some other ones. I think we hit everything except for inductive, deductive, and abductive logic. Um, and uh, the things that are related to ethics. So that's pretty cool. I'm very pleased with the, the amount of information that we got through this semester, so good job. Um, so let's talk about ethics and psychology. Ethics, how much fun. Um, it's interesting, because I mean, at some schools, they require students to take a course on ethics in order to graduate. So, Students that are political science majors, they take a course on you know, ethics as it relates to political science. Business majors take a business, eth business ethics course. And um, students often don't like that. Oh, and a lot of times things might seem common sense, but I think history has provided ample evidence um, that although it might seem obvious that something is not ethical, we keep doing unethical things again and again and again. Um, do any of you guys know about the recent ethical problem within the Association for Psychological, no, I'm sorry, the American Psychological Association. I was going to say Association for Psychology and Science, but that's not it. What? How is it? Like, news just within the last month or two that's come out. So the um, ABA was instrumental in helping the military and CIA uh, torture prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. Um, you may have heard a couple years back that there were two psychologists who um, designed protocols and things like that. Um, and you might think, oh, well, they're just acting independently, these two guys on their own. Um, but it turns out that the biggest psychological association in the world actually played a role um, in the, the torture that we did in, in Guantanamo and other places. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I think, scary to me because the APA, it has their own ethical guidelines for research. Um, and uh, I suppose if, if you push them, they might argue that we're not really doing research. So those guidelines that are meant to you know, guide us in our research, since we're not doing the research, they don't apply. That's possible. So what is research? So if we have an experiment, maybe we're conducting research, can we have uh, non-experimental research? Yeah, correlational. We can do correlational, and we can even do non-correlational research. So one type of research that I didn't talk about much um, is just descriptive research, just trying to describe some population. Um, let's see, you know, maybe I'm a politician and I want to know how my support base is before I'm going into the elections, right? So I just want a description of the population that's out there so I know potentially where to, um, where to put my efforts, right? So that would just be descriptive, potentially. Um, but research, it's not tied to a particular method. Um, you can do a case study. We haven't talked about case studies. What's a case study? Individuals that are rare. So an individual who is rare, maybe you just have access to the one. It's possible that it's not so rare in the grand scheme of things. Um, but case study research is done by, by clinicians occasionally. They have an individual who's coming to them for help, and they want to help that um, individual. And what about a case study would make it research? Did anyone take a look at the quiz for this week? It's so long. There are no other readings. Though. That's true. It just looks long because it's small. It's small. It's shorter than my study guide. Oh, yeah. So research, if we are doing something that is going to contribute to generalizable knowledge, that's research. If you think back in the, the first classes when we were talking about the scientific method, what was something, what did I say is the most important part for someone that wants to go on into a career in research? Communication. Communication, yeah. If you don't communicate, you're nothing. So the communication, what does communication do? Well, when we publish a, an article in some research journal or when we give a presentation at some conference, 
we are giving other people information that should help them come to a better understanding about some aspect of the world. So we are contributing to generalizable knowledge. Now this is very different potentially from a clinician who is working with a participant and really doesn't care about communicating their results to anyone and to contribute to generalizable knowledge. They want to learn what works best for this patient in this particular situation. They don't care so much about generalizing anything that they learn. In that situation, that's actually not research. They might even do an experimental design, but because it's not intended to contribute to generalizable knowledge, it's not considered research. So um, think about uh, companies and the things, the types of research, or I'll put that in quotes, the types of research that companies do. So if you talk to business students, you might talk to a marketing major, and they learn about market research. Um, does market research, is that supposed to contribute to generalizable knowledge? If you're doing it for a corporation? Yeah. Well, not necessarily. It depends on what the crowd is that they're looking to draw in. So like if they're selling something that's high-end, they're going to market for richer people or people with higher incomes rather than lower income. Okay, so they have some product that they want to find out who's going to buy that type of a product, right? Now think about what what it means if the results are generalizable, or if we are making uh, you know, a contribution to knowledge in general, as opposed to just our knowledge. So we find out that this particular product is really well suited for a particular subset of the, the population, right? We, we identify that subset. In fact, we have a database of that subset. Do we go and share that database with our competitors? Why not? They know the same thing. So you're doing something that looks like research. And, and when I say something that looks like research, I'm defining research very specifically here in the context that the United States government defines research. So although I would say yes, in a sense, they are doing research. They're learning something. But they're not contributing to generalizable knowledge. They take that information and they hold on to it. <laughs> right? So they can make more money. They're not sharing that information. Whereas research that happens in academic settings, maybe some non-governmental settings, and even in um, you know, privately held corporations or, or publicly held corporations. Think about Facebook. What did they get in trouble for recently? Sharing information. Uh, no, it wasn't sharing information. It was taking information and selling like who you're most likely to talk to, what you're most likely to buy to third parties. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but um, I, I'm thinking about something where they actually manipulated something. They did an experiment, a proper experiment, with random assignment. How did they manipulate people's Facebook feeds? No one knows. Wow, this was just like so big a year ago. Or at least it was in my area. <laughs> um, so they took a whole bunch of Facebook users, I forget how many, but there's thousands of Facebook users, and they randomly assigned some of the Facebook users to get fewer positive messages in their feeds. So some of you guys might have noticed that more of the messages seem to be kind of downers. Oh, my dog died. Oh, I have a test today. Oh, I have Dr. Knapp's class today. Oh, right? So downer information. Whereas other people, they removed some of the bad information so they had relatively more good information. And they wanted to see if the, the type of information that was in someone's feed would affect how people respond. Now, it turned out that it did. So when you have, I forget what the results were, but I believe it was when you have more negative stuff in your feed, you are less likely to put up positive things. If you think about it, this might make a lot of sense. So if I see on my feed, you know, someone's grandma died and, and you know, oh, this is so horrible, I don't want to say how awesome it was that I just got to see my grandma, right? Not cool. So, so potentially, uh, the things that um, we see are affecting how we, we respond. And this actually is generalizable research. Right? It's real research because 
It was meant to contribute to general knowledge. The whole reason that Facebook got in trouble for this is because they, the like scientists that were working for them published a paper on their findings. They're making, you know, contributing to generalizable knowledge. Woohoo! What was the big ethical problem? Important consent. Okay. What do you mean important consent? They didn't ask people to say, do you want to be a part of this? If you don't want to be, you can opt out. That's exactly right. They didn't say, okay, um, you know, we're going to do a study in which we do these things. Um, if you would like to participate, hey, please click yes. If you don't want to participate, please click no. Right? There was none of that. Hopefully, those of you guys who participated in the experiments um, online, at least for my research method students, um, almost all of those projects should have had something about, okay, in this study, you're going to do this. And you're going to be asked to do that. If you want to participate, then please continue watching, or please click the appropriate condition. If you don't, stop now. Right? Did you guys get that? So then by continuing to watch, or by clicking wherever you clicked, you're indicating that you are agreeing, whether it's explicitly agreeing by clicking or tacitly agreeing by continuing through, right? So in that sense, you guys, if you participated in those things, you did consent to do the research. However, people in, in the Facebook study, they didn't consent, that, that's a problem. How many of you guys are South Park fans? A few of them. How many recall the iPhone episode? <laughs> oh, yeah. Where they were, they were going to do the Sense iPad, I think. So have you guys seen the horror movie, what was it, Human Centipede? Uh, Where they stitch people together. How, I'm not going to mention. Um, but anyway, the idea with this South Park episode is that when we um, sign up for almost any online service, Facebook, Gmail, iTunes, Whatever, there are these big long things that you're supposed to like scroll through and then click, you agree. And how many people read those all the time? How many people don't read those all the time? So the idea with, with that was that, was it Kyle who ended up? I don't know, whatever. One of the South Park characters and apparently consented to basically give his life away to Apple in exchange for using the Apple stuff. Woohoo. Um, so it's possible in the, the Facebook terms of service that we have all agreed to participate in their research. I'm not sure. I haven't read through their things. Um, but if that's the case, that's still pretty sneaky and pretty unethical. Why? How does that differ from the, the consent that you get in the experiments that you were doing for us? Well, no. I mean, if it's in the if it's in the you know the license agreement, then you know that nobody's going to. Yeah, there's this expectation that no one's going to read it. It's really difficult to read. So a good informed consent should be easily readable, right? It should you should be able to read it and quickly understand what's going on. Speaking of what's going on, what types of things should and should not be in an informed consent? So you guys saw some informed consents. Expectations. Like regarding what? Like the strip test, like expectations about how times are going to differ after being in different conditions. Okay. Can you tell me more? So um, expectations about how times should differ in different conditions. Like the so in the strip test, you have the congruent condition where the names and the colors match. There's also the incongruent where the names and the colors don't match, right? Should expectations about our, our hypotheses and our predictions be an informed consent? Look, I'm showing. I'm going to show you this, and this is how I expect you to react. You said no. Why? Be a bias. If you're going to bias them. You just confounded things. Not only did you make some manipulation, but you also told them how you're expecting them to respond in the different conditions, right? So you've just confounded things if you have told them exactly what your hypotheses were and um, exactly how you're predicting that they are going to respond. So. If I'm going to give someone informed consent about participating in a Stroop experiment, like what would I tell them? Generalized information. Or like what? Basic. Um, uh, this is what you're going to do, or what you need to do, what we're trying to get you to do, kind of thing. So follow those instructions. 
So in this task, we're going to have you look at a bunch of words and name the colors that words appear in. I think I said that in my informed consent, right? So that tells you what you need to know in order to make an informed decision about participating in some research. Okay, I'm gonna see words, I'm gonna name the colors that they're in. I haven't learned necessarily what, how the colors and the words are going to go together, what the words are. Imagine that I was gonna do the street task where, uh, have you guys seen George Carlin's seven words that you don't use on TV or something like that? I think that's Carlin. Like, so the S word, the M, F, or the F word, and C word, and lots of other words you don't say on TV. Imagine that my Stroop task involved those words. Might my consent be a little bit different? Yes. How so? In a, in a sense, sorry, that's there. Put something in about um, mature, like mature, mature content. Mature content, that's exactly right. So if you did my Stroop experiment, you may have noticed when you first went there that it was restricted by age, right? So you had to say, yes, I'm 18. And it's not even that I thought that there was anything particularly you know, dangerous about my experiment. However, I wanted to make sure or have a reasonable expectation that my participants were over the age of 18. Why would I want them to be over the age of 18? They're legal adults. Yeah, if, if they are 18 or older, then they can legally provide consent. If they are under 18 in the United States, they are not able to provide consent for themselves. There might be some situations, maybe you have an emancipated minor or some you know, legal loopholes, loopholes where some individuals could potentially do that. But in general, individuals who are under 18 aren't able to make legal binding contracts that adults are, right? And they don't have the ability to consent. So I indicated, or I, you know, I put up the age restrictions so I could avoid using those participants, right? And so if I was going to use a lot of swears, might there be some people who took offense to that? Yeah. So maybe you don't like to expose yourself to that type of information. You know, you're going to the movies and I'm going to see Saw. If you don't want to see Saw, you want to see something a little less nasty. So you should have the right to know roughly how nasty of a thing that you're getting into. Because if you don't, you're not really being able to make an informed decision about whether or not you should participate. So are there any of the experiments that you guys participate, participated in that were reasonably nasty? Yes, you said. So what was nasty in the experiment? I can't remember which one it was, but it had the scene where this guy was being murdered and there's just his face smashed in. And yeah, like little kids, kids that were beaten and stuff. So yeah. you've got pictures of little kids that are beaten and dogs that are all mangled up and stuff like that. What was the informed consent like that for? It was uh, saying that this contains disturbing images uh, if you do not want to participate. Uh, did it tell you how they expected the disturbing images would affect? No. So they didn't tell you what they were predicting or what they really wanted to learn about. They probably gave some cover story to frame it generally, very broadly, without giving the specifics to, to bias you in one way or another, right? But they gave you information about the type of content that you're going to see. So um, it's interesting. At uh, this university, oh dear. <laughs> At this university last year, I was really surprised to find out that one of the senior capstone students involved pornography. Did any of you guys participate in the porn experiment? No. So they wanted to see how watching different types of videos would affect your galvanic skin response. So does anyone know what the galvanic skin response is? Yeah, so there's basically an electrode that's hooked up to your finger, and the more excited or the more nervous or anxious you are, the more you sweat. And even though you might not be able to tell that you're sweating a lot more, the slight increase in moisture allows electricity to pass through your finger a bit more easily, and the instrument can pick this up. And this experiment happened to be one of the most popular experiments um, at EOU. I wonder why. But when they had people participate, did you participate in this, or do you know people that did? No, really? That's the one where maybe that was two years ago. I don't know. Charles and Deanna were telling me about it. I was like, wow. They like ask questions, but then like showing videos on someone that I don't think was the same. Huh? Maybe I have the details of the methods wrong. Maybe I can calculate. I don't. Know. 
But anyway, um, so you were, what did, what did you say? So you yeah, got asked um, sexy questions. questions, something like that. And so <laughs> when, when you were going to participate, did they let you know that you might be asked some sexy questions beforehand? Right, because you might not want to ask, answer sexy questions. Oh, hey, would you like to participate in my experiment? I'm just going to ask you, ask you some questions. So, have you thought about doing that? <laughs> Awkward. So you need to have an idea about what you're getting into. Because the things that you're getting into could potentially pose some risks. So a good informed consent is going to tell you about the potential realistic risks. And most of the psychological uh, studies don't involve a huge amount of risks. Okay, you're going to sit in front of a computer and you're going to see boxes that are big and small and are red and green and you're going to have to look for boxes among other boxes and, you know, the risks involve boredom and the risks involve, uh, you know, potential for a seizure because you're sitting in front of a computer and I'm flashing some things up. That's a minor risk. We've never had that happen. Although one participant told me that they were getting a really big headache, um, but I think that participant was lying and they were just bored because I knew this participant and they're a pretty big gamer and they should not have had the problems that they said that they did. But when this participant said that they were getting a headache, what did I do? I stopped the experiment. That's exactly right. So why did I stop the experiment? Pardon? Yeah, but I mean experience potential signs of a seizure starting or some kind of a I don't buy that. Nah, you never know. And I don't even believe that they had a headache. Like they didn't want to risk it? Yeah, so they have the right to call out They have the right to call out. Just as you have the right to decide for yourself whether or not you want to participate, you should be free to stop participating at any time you want. So oftentimes when participants are like, oh geez, I'm really bored, can I stop? I, I tell them, yes, they can, but I also tell them, look, you know, the experiment's going to last however much longer it's projected to last, and, you know, can you, if you can finish, this would really help out. And, and, you know, I'm not going to penalize you for not finishing or anything, but it would, it would be useful if you did, because otherwise we can't use your data, right, because they didn't actually complete the experiment. So lots of times when subjects indicate maybe that they don't want to continue participating, the experimenters will indicate that you know they are free to go, but it would be useful, and leave that up to the, the participants. So again, they're informed, right, about what the risks are. The risks of them not participating involves the lot, loss of their data completely. Their data is a wash, potentially in some cases. Um, so, what do you do if you have individuals that are under 17? Parental consent. Parental consent. Is anyone 17 or under? Yes. <laughs> Is he your guardian? Is he taking care of you? So let's say you're going to participate in an experiment. And I'm, this experiment is to see like how much pain you can take. And I'm going to submerge your hand in ice water. And this it doesn't sound that painful, but after a minute or two, trust me, not feeling good. And he says that I can do this with you, right? And I'm going to stick one of your hands in the water, and I'm going to do this for five minutes, and I'm going to measure his galvanic skin response every like 30 seconds I'm going to ask him on a scale of 1 to 10 how he's feeling and I want to see if his reported um, feelings match up with the galvanic skin response. Okay? So you're in there for five, five? Yeah, whatever. Five minutes. And he's like, ah, I want to quit. And he's like, gotta do it. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? Take his hand out. You gotta, you gotta follow the subject. I need, I need to follow the subject, the person that's actually actual experiment. Um, and this can create a potential conflict of interest. Imagine that we're buddy buddies, right? We're buddy buddies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he wants to contribute to my research. But little beknownst to me, he's kind of a, a no, a bad, a bad parental figure. And he's uh, a little rough with this kid. <laughs> yeah. And so he, you know, before the experiment, he's telling him, okay, you gotta participate in this, or else, you know, I'm gonna get you when you get home. So I want you to, to do this, right? It's possible that this can happen. There can be incentives for individuals who participate. Uh, lots of times participants are paid for their time. 
And this payment, it's not supposed to be so much that it would unduly influence them to do something that they wouldn't want to do. But oftentimes it kind of is. If you are unemployed and you're gonna get 20 bucks for an hour of your kid's time, and you can come back every week for 10 weeks and get 20 bucks every week, and the kid doesn't want to participate anymore, that creates a pressure. So what should the experimenter do in a situation where the kid um, wants to stop, but indicates that maybe they're worried about stopping because their mom or their dad or their guardian is going to, to you know, think badly of them or mistreat them? Lie. Thou shalt not lie. Nope. How do you lie as an experimenter? Because uh, I, I, as an experimenter, I think lying is the bee's knees. <laughs> you could say the experiment has changed or qualifications have? Yeah, so you could come up with an explanation. Oh, you know, he performed in this one part, and based on their responses, they don't qualify for the later sessions. Thank you very much, something like that. What if the experiment's supposed to go like 50 minutes and he wants to quit after 10? Is that a doctor's appointment? Well, well no. <laughs> yeah, you could claim technical difficulties or you could even keep the kid in the experimental area and do something else. So when I participated in research, which I did when I was younger because my mom was getting her psychology degree, like mother, like son. Um, so she would bring me to college with her sometimes, and she would have me do experiments. And the mom was never in the same room with me at the same time. There are some developmental um, experiments and, and research methods that involve uh, an interaction between the mother and the child. And for a research question like that, yeah, you've got to have the, the caregiver um, there in the room. But for other things, you don't have to. And so the researcher would make it very clear to me, even though my mom was the one that signed the paper and gave her consent, they asked me if I wanted to participate. Yeah, I do. They explained what was going to happen. They told me that I could stop participating if I wanted to. They explained that if I stopped, I could go and play with something, something that would keep me entertained but wasn't like so exciting like you know a Nintendo um, that I didn't have at home that I would want to do that instead of the experiment. But there were things for me to do. So that way, if there was an issue and, and I was worried, oh, you know, I don't like this, it's making me uncomfortable, but you know, don't tell my mom. It'd be really easy to keep the kid in the room for 50 minutes and say, oh yeah, thank you, right? So um, we get consent from parents and guardians, and um, guardians may not even be guardians of, of children. They might be guardians of individuals that are suffering from like late stage Alzheimer's disease or other individuals who don't have the capacity to make an informed consent for themselves. So sometimes we can't ask people if they want to participate. Think about research with babies. So I'm going to have some baby in, in an experiment and I want to see if they pay more attention to like a, a black, black and white grid or you know lots of pretty psychedelic Jerry, not Jerry Seinfeld, Jerry Garcia. <laughs> colors, right? So I have them, they're laying down, and there's, you know, the block, black and white, and they're the Jerry Garcia colors. Which, which are they going to look at? Color. color. Depends on the shapes, actually. Though. Yeah, it depends on the shapes, which is why I said the black and white, because they like high contrast, because their visual systems are kind of messed up for a while. Anyway, so, you know, they, they're looking here, they're looking there, I'm timing how much time they spend looking at each of them, and then all of a sudden the kid's like, ah, ah, and they throw a fit. Now I can't say like, would you like to stop? <laughs> but I can see that they are not enjoying the situation anymore, right? So I have a duty to look for signs of assent, signs that they are willing to continue participating. Now, sometimes uh, the research involves um, harming the participant to some extent. Any of you guys know about the strange situation, Mary Ainsworth? So what's the strange situation? Didn't they put a kid in the room and, or the, the mom and the kid were in the room. And mom and the kid come in the room. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then a stranger came in the room. Mm -hmm. Didn't they try interacting with the kid? Or well, they the went into the room and then the mom room. left the room. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they waited and tried to see like 
or they saw how the kid would react to it, the mom leaving and the you know, what kind of attachment? Yeah, so this was used to figure out um, different attachment styles, right? So the kids, if they would get upset when their mother left or their father left or their primary caregiver left and they were comforted when they came back, that showed a secure attachment, right? Or maybe they were distressed when the, the parent left and when the parent came back, they were sort of ambivalent. And it shows a different attachment pattern. Now think about this. This is designed to be distressing. Should we do it? Yes. You say why? Because it's not like putting them back in the harm. It's not what? It's not putting them in the harm. Like there's not it is putting them in the harm. Their heart rate gets elevated. Harm. They cry. How else are you going to figure stuff out without? And the parents? How else are you going to figure stuff out without out harming people? So let's take some Jews and some gay people and <laughs> gypsies and throw them in ice baths for an hour. But it's not harm like that. It's not harm like that. It's just psychological trauma. Yeah, what do you do? We're in college for a reason. We fix it. <laughs> so um, the idea of not doing harm, this is known as non-maleficence. So if something is maleficent, you guys seen the movie Maleficent? Yes. I haven't seen it. It's, it's incredible. incredible. Good movie. Yeah, I downloaded it. Maleficent, is she someone that does harm? No. Eventually? <laughs> the name sort of fits. I mean, from the Disney movies, Maleficent was a do harm kind of a person. At least in the one that I remember from my childhood. Right? They do harm. Wow. Such a clever name for somebody. <laughs> anyway. So we don't want to do harm to our participants, but some designs necessarily will involve harm. Think about the, the drug studies that I participated in. And, and look, can you see this? What do I have there? A body part. A body part. I've got a scar here, and I've got a scar here. <laughs> Why do I have scars there? Because for two weeks, they were taking my blood almost every single hour. <laughs> And that, that was just one experiment. I, I participated in a number of experiments over a couple years. So I've got permanent scars that harm me. Is that okay? Yeah. Why? Why is that okay? You're okay now. <laughs> You're fine. You consented for it. It was minor harm. That it, it was minor harm. <laughs> Uh, you know, if we're expecting big long-term negative effects, maybe that's something that we want to avoid. So, um, what if I want to do a study and uh, hey, I'm going to inject you with uh, some radioactive chemical? Uh, is that cool? It's going to make your hair fall out. It's going to make you puke. You're going to use a ton of weight. You lose a ton of weight. What's the experiment behind that? I want to see how you feel, like how it affects your self-image. What? Oh, I thought you made like a... <laughs> so I'm doing a study on self-image and uh, I'm going to randomly assign half of you guys to get chemotherapy. Ruby? No. Why not? But it's important. If I know that people who are receiving chemotherapy suffer from lower self-esteem, then maybe there's some intervention I can do for the, the real chemo parent patients, right? Ah, like already, uh, already used, already existing patients. And then I lose the ability to random assign, so it's just a correlational study. But I could do it like that, right? Now, what if I wanted to see if, uh, um, like, chemotherapy was an effective intervention for people who are highly suicidal. We've got a group of participants, they've already made several attempts, and th these are not like, oh, I'm crying for help. These are like, oh, I want to go. So they've made several attempts. They've been hospitalized repeatedly, and they just haven't responded to jack squat. 
We've tried uh, the electromagnetic stimulation. Boom! Doesn't work. We've tried electroconvulsive therapy. That doesn't work. We've tried a whole bunch of antidepressants and antipsychotics and all sorts of things. None of that stuff works. And we think, hmm. And imagine that we have some good theoretical reason. I, I'm not just like, oh, geez, I wonder if uh, you know doing this. Like we have some mechanism, right? That we're expecting chemo to work. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this because it'd probably be a waste of time. But imagine that we had a legitimate reason to expect that chemotherapy could potentially massively reduce the incidence of further suicide attempts in very suicidal patients. Would that be worth it? What's the difference between I want to see how you you know your self esteem is versus the second? You're trying to preserve life in the second one as opposed to just like better. <laughs> Are there benefits of both types of research? Both types of research could provide some benefits. We could learn something valuable, right? Benefits outweigh the risks. That's exactly right. We need to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risks. It's not that we can't do harm when we're doing research, but that. If we are doing any harm, that harm should be justified. We should have a good reason for doing it. And more importantly, the benefits should outweigh the risks. So if we're doing research where the benefits are minimal, oh wow, we want to see if, if this changes your color perception. Here's some chemotherapy. I think that it's going to affect your rods and cones, yeah. right? How big of a deal is that going to have for you? Probably not. It might be something interesting for the scientific community, but the, the, the risks really outweigh the benefits, right? But in the second situation, you might actually be saving someone's lives. If you think about a lot of the medical um, research that's done in the operating theater, right? Something new has happened. No one's ever done this procedure yet, and the, the surgeon has an idea. Maybe I could do this, right? They're, they're doing basically a little experiment right then. In the control group, there are all the other people that they've worked on before. And so they do something new. That new thing could kill the individual. So why do they do that new thing? They do it because they have an expectation that if we do this, they might live. If we don't do this, the probability is that they're going to die. Right? So what groups are charged with weighing the risks and the benefits of research? Boards, institutional review boards, or any institution in the United States that receives federal funding, any human subjects research must be vetted by an institutional review board. And the review board, they are charged with looking at the, the research, at the intended benefits, at the intended risks, and making a determination about whether those risks outweigh the benefits or vice versa. Only those situations in which the benefits are thought to outweigh the risks should be approved for research. Did you notice in, I'm, I'm wondering how many of you guys did the debriefings for the, the experiments that you participated in. Did any of you see the debriefings? Like after you participated in the yeah. There was a couple of things. There should have been on videos, like my street video. If you click yeah, there, you get to the debrief. There's a, a couple of them that said, if you want to be debriefed, send them. yes. Well, in one of the videos, I was going to say in the, the videos, ones. I thought they explained a little bit about uh -huh. what they were doing. A little, I mean, but little. If you want more, more information. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. If you want more information, contact them. But they should have had at least, you know, here's what, here's why we did this, and here's sort of what we were expecting to find. Right. That was my point. Brain part. More pizza. <laughs> more pizza. I don't know. So in the debriefing, did you see something that said if you have concerns about any of your um, rights being violated, who you should contact? Contact Dr. Charles Lyons. He's the chair of the Institutional Review Board, right? So if there's a problem, then the, the Institutional Review Board that's charged with making sure our participants are respected. A lot of the things that researchers do are based on respect. We allow you to make your own decision. That's showing respect for you. We allow you to back out if you want to. That's showing respect for you. We give you information at the end to tell you what you've been doing. That's also showing you respect, right? So um, I said that 
any institution receiving federal funds that's engaging in human subjects research has to have one of these institutional review boards. It doesn't have to be called an IRB, an institutional review board. It could be a human subjects board or have some other name, but the task is the same. Now, I said human subjects research. So I've already said that research is basically um, some type of study where you are intending to um, contribute to generalizable knowledge. So that's what research is. What are human subjects? Because only human subjects research needs to be vetted. I'm sorry, also animal research needs to be vetted too. But if you're not doing human subjects or animal research, you don't have to necessarily get vetted by the IRB. Imagine the individuals in the computer science department and they come up with a new algorithm for sorting lists of words and they want to see if it's faster than the existing algorithms. They don't have to run that through an, or through an IRB. Why? It's not going to hurt any human participants potentially. So what are human subjects? Human subjects research. Imagine that I am going to go to, uh, to schools and I'm going to watch children or maybe I'm going to go to a mall and watch people. And I'm just going to, you know, very unobtrusively, it's not like I'm hiding under the bushes. I'm just sitting out there like I'm reading a book, but really I'm, there's a mirror and I'm looking at the kids. <laughs> and what I'm looking is, I don't know what the independent dependent variables are, maybe like um, see who, who starts more fights on the playground, boys or girls, and I don't know, or different ages, something like that, whatever, whatever it is. Is that human subjects research? Yeah. Why? Because you're studying humans. Am I? I am studying the behavior of humans, but human subjects research actually, just like research, has a very technical and precise definition. So I completely agree with you that I am watching and I am observing humans. For human subjects research to be human subjects research, you have to use humans that are living. If they're dead, it's not human subjects research. So if you go and you start digging through uh, um, Who's the comedian who died recently? Robin Williams. Yeah, Robin Williams. So you start going through his garbage to try to get a sense for like what, what was going on with him. That's not human subjects research. He's dead. Yes, he was a human. He's dead now. Not human subjects research. So it needs to be living. Okay, like this. Human subjects. So living. What else? The data that you collect from the human subjects has to involve an interaction between you and the subjects. Did you enjoy the pizza? Yes. If that question was meant to lead to generalizable or generalizable knowledge, which it wasn't, but if that was, that's human subjects research. I interacted with him. So living data from interaction. This could be an, an intervention too. Um, so maybe I'm, you know, sitting down and I'm not really doing any interaction, but I have someone, some person fall in front of someone, and I want to see how people respond. Right? That data I'm getting is involving an interaction that I have facilitated. That's human subject research. There's no interaction, which means just sitting on a playground and do do do. No interaction, not human subjects research, unless. Or I'm just going to put personally ID. Unless we are collecting personally identifiable information. So if I'm watching people and you know I'm listening to their names or I'm recording their uh, um, their license plates as they drive up to the park or something, so I can get an idea about where they're from, which counties. Uh, they live in because I'm interested in doing something like that. If I am recording their license plate numbers, that's personally identifiable information. So would you consider a uh, like a private investigator a uh, human researcher because they're looking at No, I don't. And why wouldn't I consider a PI to be no, doing human subjects research? There's no interaction. 
necessarily. But there's personal. There's personally identifiable information. So it's either data obtained through an interaction or data that's that's personally identifiable. So imagine the situation where instead of just watching the kids on the playground, I set up a video camera and I tape them. Now I have personally identifiable information, right? Google could get that because it's up in the cloud maybe and then process the, the facial information. Actually, if it was up in the cloud, that would be a big ethical violation unless you've got it encrypted and locked it. And locked away, yeah. But that's personally identifiable information, your pictures. That's not generalizable. Yeah, the, the PI, they are working for a client and they want to provide knowledge to that client, not to the entire world. Which is interesting. So if the client were to disperse the information to the world, would they be in trouble or would that be um, I would guess that the person who distributed it could potentially be in trouble. The PI. The PI would get in trouble? It's, well, if the person who's receiving the information tells people that it necessarily, well, I guess it's an outcome. Yeah. It's out of the PI's hands. Okay. At that point. But it's interesting because think about what, what people can do for people in Us Weekly. So, oh my goodness, look at that. Angelina Jolie, she's getting a little chubby, huh? Click, 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 personally identifiable information meant to produce generalizable knowledge. Oh my goodness, oh, we lost some weight again. Click, click, click. <laughs> That's generalizable information, and it's, it's personally identifiable, but it also falls within the realm of photojournalism, which is a bit different type of generalization. Realizable information. It's, it's interesting because sometimes there are things that I as a researcher would absolutely love to do that television producers do all the time that I would never be allowed to do because I have to have my research vetted by IRBs. Production companies, they don't have to do that. So let's give poor people a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars and have them fight. Yeah! All right. See you guys. <laughs>